Volume two, chapter three of The Day Will Come by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three. Ruin hath taught me thus to ruminate. That time will come and take my love away. This thought is as a death which cannot choose but weep to have that which it fears to lose. That ghastly idea mooted by Cuthbert Ramsay the idea of an unsatisfied hatred still hovering like a bird of prey over the heads of juanita and her child ready to make its deadly swoop in the hour that should see her most helpless and unprotected gave a new impetus to theodore's mind and he applied himself again to the apparently hopeless endeavour to find the motive of the murder and the person of the murderer as an initial step he invited mr churton to dine with him at his chambers entertained that gentleman with a well-chosen little dinner sent in from a famous tavern in the strand and a bottle of unexceptionable port after dinner and by this innocent means got the detective into an expansive frame of mind and induced him to discuss the cheriton murder in all its bearings the result of the long evening's talk differed in hardly any point from the opinion which mr churton had formulated at cheriton the motive of the murder must be looked for in some past wrong or fancied wrong inflicted upon the murderer and again mr churton returned to his point that there was a woman at the bottom of it do you mean that a woman fired the shot decidedly not i mean that a woman was the motive power women are not given to avenging their wrongs with their own hands they will instigate the men who love them to desperate crimes unconsciously perhaps for they are the first to howl when the crime has been committed and the lover's neck is in danger but jealousy is the most powerful factor of all and i take it jealousy was at the bottom of the cheriton crime i take it that some intrigue of sir godfrey's youth was at the root of the matter strange as you may consider such a belief mr churton i am inclined to think that sir godfrey's youth was innocent of intrigues that he never loved any woman except my cousin whom he adored from the time he was eighteen when she was a lovely child of eleven it was a very romantic attachment and the kind of attachment which keeps a man clear of low associations you and lord cheriton tell me the same story sir said the detective with a touch of impatience but if this immaculate young man never injured anybody how do you account for that bullet it is unaccountable except upon a far-fetched hypothesis what may that be that the act of vengeance though striking godfrey carmichael was aimed at lord cheriton that the blow was meant to ruin his daughter's life and by ricochet strike him to the heart i think we have spoken of this possibility before to-night after that evening with churton theodore made up his mind that there was no assistance to be looked for from this quarter the detective had exhausted his means of investigation and had nothing further to suggest he was too practical a man to waste time or thought upon speculative theories theodore saw therefore that if he were to pursue the subject further he must think and work for himself after considering the question from every possible point of view he became the more established in the idea that godfrey carmichael had been the scapegoat of another man's sin the vicarious victim whose death was to strike at a guilty life of his youth it was easy to know all that there was to be known he had lived in the sight of his fellow-men a young man of too much social importance to be able to hide any youthful indiscretions or wrong-doing but what of that other and so much longer life what of the early struggles of the self-made man what of the history of james dalbrook in those long years of bachelor life in london when he was slowly working his way to the front might not there have been some hidden sin in that life some sin dark enough to awaken a sleepless vengeance a malignity which should descend upon him in a day of peace and prosperity like a thunderbolt from a clear and quiet sky a man who marries at forty years of age has generally some kind of history before his marriage and it was in that history theodore told himself he must look for the secret of godfrey carmichael's death he was loyal to his kinsman and his friend he was inspired by no prurient curiosity no envious inclination to belittle the great man he was prompted solely by his desire to unearth the hidden foe and to provide for the safety of juanita's future life meditating upon his past intercourse with lord cheriton and upon every familiar conversation which he was able to recall he was surprised to find how very little his kinsman had ever related of his london life before the time when he took silk and married a rich wife his allusions to that earlier period had been of the briefest he had shown none of that egotistical pleasure which most successful men feel in talking of their struggles and the rosy dawn of fame those first triumphs 
small perhaps in themselves but the aftertaste of which is sweeter in the mouth than the larger victories of the flood-tide he had never talked of any affairs of the heart any of those lighter flirtations and unfinished romances which elderly men love to recall his history so far as it could be judged by his conversation had been a blank either the man must have been a legal machine a passionless piece of human clay caring for nothing but professional achievement in those eighteen years of manhood between his call to the bar and his marriage or he had lived a life which he could not afford to talk about he was either of a duller clay than his fellow-men or he had a hidden history now as it was hardly possible that james dalbrook judged from either a psychological or a physiological standpoint could have been dull and cold and plodding and passionless at any period of his career there remained the inference that he had a secret history living under the very roof that had sheltered his cousin in the greater part of his professional career theodore dalbrook arrived at this conclusion what kind of a life had he lived that young barrister briefless and friendless at the outset whose name was eventually to become a power a weight bringing down the judicial scale on the side of victory just as archer's writing was supposed to secure the winning of a race how had he lived in those early years when the fight was all before him what friends had he made for himself and what enemies what love or what hate had agitated his existence the investigator could only approach the question in the most commonplace manner it was nearly a quarter of a century since james dalbrook had been a tenant of that ground-floor set above which theodore was pacing up and down in the summer dusk he had to find some one who remembered him at that time it would not be his present laundress a buxom matron of about five-and-thirty who had never been known to any present inhabitant of ferret court without the encumbrance of a baby in arms or a baby at the breast as fast as one baby was disposed of there was another coming forward to take its place she always brought her baby with her and left it about in obscure corners like an umbrella it was always of the order of infant designated good that is to say it was not a squalling baby there were some of mrs armstrong's clients who suspected her of keeping it in a semi-narcotized condition in the interest of her profession but when this practice was hinted at the matron referred to the necessities of teething and hoped she did not require to be reminded of her duty as a mother this good person brought in the lighted lamp while theodore was pacing up and down the narrow limits of his sitting-room she placed the lamp on the table looked inquiringly at her employer and then retired only to return with the tea-tray which she arranged lingeringly she was a talkative person with an active intellect and it irked her to leave the room without any scrap of conversation were it only an inquiry about the postman or a casual remark upon the weather nothing being forthcoming from mr dalbrook she withdrew to the door but paused on the threshold and dropped a curtsey i'm afraid we're going to have a storm to-night sir she said the fear was a thing of the moment inspired by her desire to talk do you think so mrs armstrong i do indeed sir it couldn't be that heavy if there wasn't thunder in the air perhaps not replied theodore indifferently ah by the way how long have you looked after these chambers from three years before i was married sir is that long lor yes sir i should think it was why my joseph was thirteen on his last birthday let me see that would mean about seventeen years wouldn't it yes sir and i suppose you knew nothing about the chambers before that time i won't say that sir i've known them more or less ever since i could run alone mother looked after them before me it was only when the rheumatics took such firm hold of her this was said as if theodore were thoroughly posted in the case that mother gave up she had done for the gentleman in this house for over twenty years though when she married father she never thought to have to do such work as this he being a master carpenter and cabinet maker with a nice business and she'd been brought up different and i had more education than any of us ever had then your mother must have known this house when mr james dalbrook had the ground floor the mr dalbrook who is now lord cheriton said theodore cutting short this biographical matter i should think she did sir many's the time i've heard her talk of him he was just like you sir in his ways as far as i can gather very quiet and very studious she waited upon him for nearly twelve years so she ought to be a judge of his character i should like to have a chat with your mother some of these days mrs armstrong would you sir i'm sure she'd be delighted she loves talking over old times she's none of your radicals that are all for changing things like my husband 
and she feels quite proud of having done for lord cheriton when he was just like any other young gentleman in ferret court any time you'd like to step round to our place sir mother would be happy to see you she'd be glad to wait upon you but she's crippled with the rheumatics and it's as much as she can do to get upstairs of a night and downstairs of a morning i'll call upon her to-morrow afternoon if that will be convenient no fear of that sir shall i look round at four o'clock and show you where she lives sir it's not above five minutes walk if you please i shall be very much obliged gadbolt's lane was one of the obscurest alleys between the temple and st bride's church but it was as well known in the locality as if it had been regent street thither mrs armstrong conducted her employer on a sultry june afternoon and admitted him with her own private key into one of the narrowest houses he had ever seen a house of three stories with one window in each story and with a tiny street door squeezed in between the parlour window and the next house a house which if it had stood alone would have been a tower upon the narrow street door appeared a wide brass plate inscribed with the name of j w armstrong plumber and in the parlour window were exhibited various indications of the plumbing trade on a smaller brass plate just below the knocker appeared the modest legend miss mobley ladies own materials made up the little parlour behind the plumber's emblems was very close and stuffy upon this midsummer afternoon for mrs duggett's complaint necessitated a fire in season and out of season but it was also spotlessly clean and preparations had evidently been made for an afternoon tea of an especially delicate character there was a rack of such thin dry toast as mrs armstrong's employer affected and there was a choice pat of aylesbury butter set forth upon the whitest of tablecloths and flanked by a glass jar of jam the glass receptacle being of that ornate character which dazzles the purchaser into comparative indifference as to the quality of the jam just as admiring man caught by outward beauty is apt to shut his eyes to the lack of more lasting charms in the way of temper and character mother thought perhaps you'd honour her by taking a cup of tea this warm afternoon sir said mrs armstrong when theodore had seated himself opposite the invalid and then you can have your little talk over old times while i look after armstrong's supper he'll eat any bit i choose to give him for his dinner and there's days he don't get no dinner at all but he always looks for something tasty for supper don't he mother mrs duggett acknowledged this trait in her son-in-law's character and theodore having graciously accepted her hospitality mrs armstrong poured out the tea and waited upon the distinguished guest and having done this withdrew to her domestic duties she was visible in front of the window five minutes afterwards setting out with a basket over her arm evidently in quest of the something tasty that was needful to her husband's well-being your daughter tells me that you remember my cousin lord cheriton when he was mr dalbrook said theodore when he and the old woman were alone together except for the presence of a very familiar black cat which pushed its chilly nose into theodore's hand and rubbed its sleek fur against theodore's legs with an air of slavish adulation it isn't everybody that tom takes to said mrs duggett touched by her favourite's conduct he's a rare judge of character is tom i've had him from a kitten and his mother before him yes sir i ought to remember his lordship seeing that i waited upon him for over eleven years and a quiet gentleman he was to attend upon giving next to no trouble and never using bad language or coming home the worse for drink as i've known a gentleman behave in that very set did he live in his chambers all that time well sir nominally he did but actually he didn't he had his bedroom and his bathroom just as you have and the rooms was furnished pretty comfortable and everything about them was very neat for he was uncommonly particular was mr dalbrook and he was always there of a day and all day long except when he was at the law courts for there never was a more persevering gentleman but after the first three years i can't say that he lived in ferret court he came there by nine or ten o'clock every morning and sometimes he stayed till ten o'clock at night and sometimes he left as early as five in the afternoon but he didn't live there no more after the third year when he was beginning to get on a bit there was his rooms and there was nothing altered except that he took away his dressing-case and a good many of his clothes but there was everything left that he wanted for his toilette and all in apple pie order for him to fall back upon his old ways at any time only as i said before he didn't live there no longer and instead of having his dinner in his own room at seven o'clock he never took anything more than a biscuit and a glass of sherry or a brandy and soda 
did this change in his habits come about suddenly yes sir it did without an hour's warning i comes to his rooms one morning and finds that his bed hasn't been slept in and i finds a little bit of a pencil note from him to say that he would be stopping out of town for a few days he was away over a fortnight and from time to time to the end of my service in ferret court he never spent another night there he had taken lodgings out of town i conclude i suppose you knew his other address no sir he never told me where his home was for of course he must have had a home somewhere no man would be a waif and stray for all those years above all such a steady-going gentleman as mr dalbrook i've heard other gentlemen accuse him of being a hermit one never sees you nowhere they says you're as steady as old time they says and so he was but he was very secret with his steadiness had you any idea where that second home of his was in what part of the suburbs it could not have been very far from london since you say he came to his chambers before ten o'clock every morning it was oftener nine than ten sir said mrs Duggett. she paused a little before replying to his question watching him with a sly smile as he caressed the obtrusive cat she had her own notions as to the motive of his curiosity he had expectations from lord cheriton perhaps and he wanted to discover if there were anything in the background of his kinsman's history which was likely to interfere with the fruition of his mercenary hopes it was a good many years after mr dalbrook left off sleeping at his chambers that i made a sort of discovery she said and i knew my place too well to take any advantage of that discovery but still i had my suspicions and i believe they were not far off the truth what was the nature of your discovery oh well you see sir it wasn't much to talk about only it set me thinking it was two or three years before mr dalbrook left ferret court and went to that first floor set in king's bench walk but he was beginning to be a great man and he had more work than he could do slave as hard as he might and he did slave i can tell you sir his rooms in ferret court were very shabby they hadn't had a bit of paint or a pail of whitewash for i don't know how long so just before the long vacation he says to me i'm going to get these rooms done up mrs duggett while i'm out of town i've got a estimate from a party in holborn and he's to paint the wainscot and clear coal the ceiling and do the whole thing for nine pounds seven and eight pence in a workmanlike manner you'll please to clean up after him and do away with all the waste paper and rubbish and get everything tidy before november mrs duggett paused and refreshed herself with half a cup of tea and apologized for the obtrusiveness of the cat i hope you don't object to cats sir theodore smiled reflecting that any man who objected to cats would have fled from that stuffy parlour before now no i am rather fond of them as an inferior order of dog well now as to this discovery of yours mrs duggett i'm coming to it as fast as i can sir you must know that there was a lot of waste paper in one of the closets beside the fireplace and you are aware how roomy those closets in ferret court are i never held with burning waste paper first because it's dangerous with regard to fire and next because they'll give you three shillings a sack for it at some of the paper mills so i had always emptied the waste paper baskets into this closet which was made no other use of and the bottom of the closet was chock full of old letters envelopes pamphlets and such like so i took my sack and i sat down on the floor and filled it now as i was putting in the papers by handfuls taking my time over it for the painters wasn't coming till the following monday and all my gentlemen was away on their holidays i was struck by seeing such a number of envelopes addressed to the same name j danvers esq myrtle cottage camberwell grove how did mr dalbrook come to have all those envelopes belonging to mr danvers there must have been letters inside the envelopes and what business had he with mr danvers letters they may have been letters bearing upon some case on which he was engaged said theodore so they might sir but would he have the letters asked the laundress shrewdly wouldn't that be the solicitor's business you are right mrs duggett i see you have profited by your experience in the temple i had the curiosity to look at the postmarks on those envelopes sir there was over a hundred of em i should think some whole and some torn across and the postmarks told me that they spread over years 
they most of em looked like tradesmen's envelopes and the camberwell postmark was on a good many of em that closet hadn't been cleared out for eight or nine years to my knowledge and those envelopes went back for the best part of that time and the longer i looked at them the more i wondered who mr danvers was and did you come to any conclusion at last well sir i had my own idea about it but it isn't my place to say what the idea was come come mrs duggett you have no employer now and you are beholden to no one you are a free agent and have a perfect right to give expression to your opinion if i thought it would go no further sir it shall go no further very well then sir to be candid i thought that james dalbrook and j danvers esq were the same person and that mr dalbrook had been living in camberwell grove under an assumed name would not that seem a very curious thing for a professional man in mr dalbrook's position to do inquired theodore gravely it might be curious to you sir but i have seen a good deal of professional gentlemen in my time and it didn't strike me as very uncommon gentlemen have their own reasons for what they do and the more particular they are from a professional point of view the more convenient they may find it to make a little alteration in their names now and again mrs duggett looked at him with a significant shrewdness which gave her the air of a female mephistopheles a creature deeply versed in all things evil did your curiosity prompt you to try and verify your suspicions he asked the old woman looked at him searchingly before she answered as if trying to discover what value there might be for him in any information she had it in her power to give or to withhold so far she had been carried along by her inherent love of gossip stimulated by the wish to stand well with her daughter's employer and perhaps with a view to such small amenities as a pound of tea or a bottle of whisky but at this point something in theodore's earnest manner suggested to her that her knowledge of his kinsman's life might have a marketable value and she therefore became newly reticent it doesn't become me to talk about a gentleman like mr dalbrook your namesake and blood relation too sir she said folding her rheumatic hands meekly i'm afraid i've made too free with my tongue already theodore did not answer her immediately he took a letter-case from his breast pocket and slowly and deliberately extracted two crisp banknotes from one of the divisions these he opened and spread calmly and carefully on the table smoothing out their crisp freshness which crackled under his hand there is something very pleasant in the aspect of a new banknote money created expressly as it were for the first owner virgin wealth pure and uncontaminated by the dealings of the multitude these were only five pound notes it is true the lowest in the scale of english paper money in the eye of a millionaire infinitesimal as the grains of sand on the seashore yet to mrs duggett those two notes lying on the table in front of her suggested vast wealth it is doubtful if she had ever seen two notes together in the whole of her previous experience her largest payment was a quarter's rent her largest receipt had been a quarter's wages she had managed to save a little money in the course of her laborious days but her savings had been accumulated in sovereigns and half-sovereigns which had been promptly transferred to the savings bank banknotes to her mind were the symbols of the surplus wealth now i am not going to beat about the bush mrs duggett said theodore with a matter-of-fact air i have a great respect for my kinsman lord cheriton who has been a kind friend to me you may be assured therefore that if i am curious about his past life i mean him no harm i have reasons of my own which it is not convenient for me to explain for wanting to know all about his early struggles his friends and his enemies i feel perfectly sure that you followed up your discovery of those envelopes that you took the trouble to find myrtle cottage and to ascertain the kind of people who lived there her face told him that he was right if you choose to be frank with me and tell me all you can those two five-pound notes are very much at your service if you prefer to hold your tongue i can only wish you a good afternoon and try to make my discoveries unaided which will not be very easy after a lapse of over twenty years i don't want to keep any useful information from you sir provided you'll promise not to let anything i may tell you get to lady cheriton's ears i shouldn't like to make unhappiness between man and wife i promise that lady cheriton shall not be made unhappy by any indiscretion of mine that's all i care about sir said mrs duggett piously with her keen old eye upon the notes 
and be sure of that i don't mind owning that i did take the trouble to follow up the address upon the envelope now when a gentleman like mr dalbrook a gentleman as always pays his way regular and stands high in his profession when such a gentleman as that changes his name you may be sure there's a lady in the case if you take up a paper sir and happen to glance at a divorce case promiscuous as i do sometimes when my son-in-law leaves his telegraph or his echo lying about you'll find that the gentleman who runs away with the lady always changes his name first thing whether he and the lady go to an hotel or takes lodgings or go on the continent he always takes another name i don't think the change does him much good for wherever he goes people seem to know all about him and come out with their knowledge in court directly it's wanted but it seems as if he must always act so and act so he does theodore submitted to this disquisition in silence but he touched the notes lightly with his fingers and made them crackle by way of stimulus to mrs duggett's intellect i felt sure if mr dalbrook had been living at myrtle cottage under the name of danvers there was a lady mixed up in it and being in the long vacation when i knew he generally went abroad i thought i would try and satisfy myself about him i thought i should feel more comfortable in waiting upon him when i knew the worst and then camberwell grove was such a little way off it would be just a nice outing for me of a summer evening so what did i do one lovely warm afternoon but take my tea a little earlier than usual and trot off to the corner of lancaster place where i wait for a waterloo bus coming sauntering along the strand as if it was time for slaves and there was no such things as loop lines or trains to be caught i hadn't no train to catch so i didn't mind the sauntering and the dawdling and the taking up and setting down i had all the summer evening before me when i got out at the green and made my way to the grove it's a beautiful romantic place camberwell grove sir i don't know whether you know it but if you do i'm sure you'll own that there ain't a prettier neighbourhood near london twenty years ago they used still to show you the garden where george barnwell murdered his uncle but i dare say that's been done away with by now it took me a good time to find myrtle cottage for it was one of the smallest houses in the grove and it stood back in a pretty little garden and there was nothing on the gate to tell if it was myrtle or otherwise but i did find it at last thanks to a young housemaid who was standing at the gate talking to a grocer's lad the grocer's lad made off when he saw me and for the first few minutes the girl was inclined to be disagreeable but she came round very quickly and i dare say she was glad to have someone to talk to on that solitary summer evening cook's out for her holiday she says and i can't stop in the house alone and then we got talking and after we talked a bit standing at the gate she asked me into the garden where there was a long narrow grass plot screened off from the high road by two horse chestnut trees and some laburnums and there was some garden chairs and a table on the grass and the young woman asked me to sit down she'd got her work basket out there and she'd been making herself an apron i can't bear the house of a summer evening she says it gives me the horrors well we talked of her master and mistress as was natural she'd lived with them over a twelve month and it was a pretty good place but very dull and the missus had a temper and was dreadfully particular and expected things as nice as if she had ten servants instead of two and was very mean into the bargain and seemed afraid of spending money i shouldn't be so particular if i was her the girl said and then she told me that she knew things wasn't all right though they seemed a very respectable couple and the lady went to church regularly what made her suspect that things were wrong asked theodore mrs duggett having paused at this point of her narrative oh sir servants always know they can't live six months in a house without finding out how the land lies they've got so little to think of you see except their masters and mistresses you can't wonder if they're always on the watch and the listen meaning no harm poor things if you was shut up in a stuffy little kitchen all day never seeing no one but the lads from the tradespeople for two or three minutes at a time you'd watch and you'd listen it's human nature people don't like reading servants and they don't like gadding servants so they must put up with servants that think a good deal of what's going on round them the housemaid told me she was sure from the solitary way mr and mrs danvers lived that there was a screw loose somewhere no one never comes near them she said and she never goes nowhere except for a walk with him no visitors no friends 
i can't think how she bears her life she hasn't a party gown even if anybody asked her to a party she couldn't go when he took her abroad last month she was all in a fluster and excitement like a child or like a prisoner that's going to be let out of prison she shook hands with cook and me when she said good-bye and that isn't like her i feel so happy jane she says i don't know what i'm doing no more i think she did she looked quite wild with pleasure and quite young too in her new bonnet although in a general way she looks older than him and then the girl told me how fond she was of him although she showed her temper now and then even to him not often the girl said and any quarrel with him threw her into a dreadful way afterwards and she would lie awake and sob all night long the girl had heard her for it was a trumpery little house though it was pretty to look at and the walls were very thin i could see with my own eyes that it wasn't much of a house a sort of dressed-up cottage smothered with creepers up to the roof it looked pretty and countrified after the temple and i could understand that mr dalbrook liked living in such a lovely place as camberwell grove did you find out what the lady was like asked theodore you may be sure i tried to do that sir how could i help being interested in a lady that had such an influence over one of my gentlemen the girl told me that mrs danvers was one of the has-beens she had been handsome perhaps once upon a time and she might have had a fine figure once upon a time but she had neither face nor figure now she was pale and careworn and she was very thin she didn't do anything to set herself off either like other ladies of five-and-thirty she wore the same merino gown month after month and she had only one silk gown in her wardrobe she was always neat and nice like a lady but she didn't seem to care much how she looked she told the girl once that she and mr danvers would be better off by and by and then all things would be different with them i am only waiting for those happier days she says but the girl fancied she would be an old woman before those days came were there any children i could not find out for certain the girl fancied from chance words she had overheard that there had been a baby but that it had been sent away and that this was a grievance between them and came up when they quarrelled which was not often as i said before altogether i left camberwell grove feeling very sorry for the lady who was called mrs danvers and i thought it was a great pity if mr dalbrook wanted to make a home for himself he couldn't have managed it better i made great friends with jane the housemaid before i left that garden and i asked her when she had an evening out to come and take a cup of tea with me and if she could get leave to go to the theatre my youngest son who was living at home then could take her along with my daughter who was then unmarried and in service in new bridge street the young woman came once about christmas time and she told me things were just the same as they had been at myrtle cottage she talked very freely about mr and mrs danvers over her tea but she had no idea that he was benown to me or that he was a barrister with chambers in the temple she thought he was something in the city i asked her if it was mr danvers who was mean and kept his lady short of money but she thought not she thought it was mrs danvers who had a kind of mania for saving for she was quite put out if mr danvers brought her home a present that cost a few pounds it seemed as if they were saving up for some purpose for they used to talk to each other of the money he was putting by and it was plain they were looking forward to a better house and a happier kind of life jane thought that either she had a husband hidden away somewhere in a lunatic asylum perhaps or he had another wife mrs duggett stopped to replenish the thrifty little fire with a very small scoopful of coals during which operation the sleek black cat leaped upon her back and balanced himself upon her shoulders while she bent over the grate well sir that was jane's first and last visit she got married all of a sudden before lady day and she went to live in the country where her husband was postman in her native village and i never see no more of her i went to camberwell grove again in the long vacation when i knew mr dalbrook was away but i found only an old woman in the house as caretaker stone deaf and disagreeable into the bargain mr dalbrook moved into king's bench walk the following year and less than six months after that i saw his marriage in the papers and his clerk told me he had married a very rich young lady and was going to buy an estate in the country i went to have another look at the cottage soon after mr dalbrook's marriage 
and i found the garden gate locked and a board up to say that the house was to be let unfurnished and that sir is all i could ever find out about the lady called mrs danvers and this history of the home in camberwell grove is all you ever knew about mr james dalbrook's life outside the chambers in ferret court yes sir that is all i ever heard promiscuously or otherwise well mrs duggett you have been frank with me and you have earned my little present said theodore handing her the two notes which her old fingers touched tremulously in a rapture that was too much for words it was with an effort that she faltered out her thanks for his generosity which she protested she had never looked for theodore walked back towards the temple deep in thought indeed so troubled and perplexed were his thoughts that upon approaching parrot court he stopped short and instead of going straight to his chambers turned aside and went to the gardens where he walked up and down the same gravel path for an hour pondering upon that picture of the hidden home in camberwell grove conjured up before him by the loquacious laundress yes he could imagine that obscure existence almost as if he had seen it with his bodily eyes he could fancy the solitary home where never kinsman or familiar friend crossed the threshold a home destitute of all home ties and homely associations a home never smiled upon by the parson of the parish cut off from all local interests identified with nothing a mystery among the commonplace dwellings around and about it a subject for furtive observation from the neighbours he could fancy those two lonely lives preying upon each other too closely united for peaceful union the woman too utterly dependent upon the man she feeling her dependence a degradation he feeling her helplessness a burden he could picture them loving each other perhaps passionately jealously to the last and yet weary of each other worn out and weighed down by the narrowness of a life walled off from the rest of the world in all its changeful interests and widening sympathies and then he saw the picture in still darker colours as it might have been ere that unknown figure faded from the canvas he thought of the ambitious successful barrister heartsick at the fetters which he had fastened upon his life tired of his faded mistress seeing all gates open to him were he but free to pass them still living apart from the world at a time of life when all the social instincts are at their highest development when a man loves the society of his fellow-men the friction of crowds the sound of his own voice and every social tribute that the world can offer to his talents and his success he saw his kinsman galled by the chain which love and honour had hung about him loathing his bondage longing for liberty saw him with the possibility of a brilliant marriage suddenly offering itself to him a lovely girl ready to throw herself into his arms a fortune at his feet and the keen ambition of a self-made man goading him like a spur how did it end did death set him free death the loosener of all bonds or did his mistress sacrifice herself and her broken heart to his welfare and of her own accord release him there are women capable of such sacrifices it would seem that his disentanglement however it came about had been perfect of its kind for no rumour of a youthful intrigue no scandal about a cast-off mistress had ever clouded the married life of james dalbrook even in cheriton village where the very smallest nucleus in the way of fact was apt to swell into a gigantic scandal even at cheriton nobody had ever hinted at indiscretions in the earlier years of the local magnate and then theodore dalbrook asked himself the essential question what bearing if any had this episode of his kinsman's life upon the murderer of juanita's husband what dark and vengeful figure lurked in the background of that common story of dishonourable love an outraged husband a brother a father that obscure life apart from friends and acquaintances would show that some great wrong had been done some sacred tie had been broken only a sinful union so hides its furtive happiness only a deep sense of degradation will reconcile a woman to banishment from the society of her own sex whether that forsaken mistress were dead or living there might lurk in her sad history the elements of tragedy the motive for a ghastly revenge and on this account the story possessed a grim fascination for theodore dalbrook he lay awake the greater part of the night thinking in a fitful way of that illicit menage in the unfashionable suburb the suburb whose very existence is unknown to society he fell asleep long after the sun was up only to dream confusedly of a strange woman who was now james dalbrook's lawful wife and now his victim and whose face had vague resemblances to other faces and who was and was not half a dozen other women in succession 
he walked to camberwell on the following afternoon surprised at the strange world through which he passed on his way there the teeming busy noisy world the world which makes such a hard fight for life the grove itself after that bustling seething road seemed a place in which nightingales might have warbled and laughing girls hidden from their lovers in the summer dusk the very atmosphere of decay from a better state was soothing there were trees still and gardens and here and there pretty old-fashioned houses and in a long narrow garden between two larger houses he found myrtle cottage there was a board up and the neglected garden indicated that the cottage had been a long time without a tenant there was a policeman's wife living in it with a colony of small children in the cotton pinafore stage of existence and with noses dependent upon maternal supervision so much so that scarcely had the matron attended to one small snub than her attention was called off to another which gave a distracted air to all her conversation she took mr dalbrook over the house and expatiated upon the damp walls and the utter incompetence of the cistern and pipes to meet the exigencies of a family which was the more to be regretted on the ground that the landlord declined to do anything in the way of repairs as he intended to pull the house down in a few years with a view to making better use of the ground and indeed that's about all it's fit for said the policeman's wife it ain't fit for anybody to live in the rooms had even a more desolate look than rooms in empty houses usually have in consequence of this long neglect the cottage had been empty for two years and a half long enough for the damp to make hideous blotches upon all the walls and trace discoloured maps of imaginary continents upon all the ceilings long enough for the spiders to weave their webs in all the corners for dust to eat deep into the iron grates and for dust and dirt to obscure every window theodore stood in the room which had once been a drawing-room and which boasted of a wide french window looking out upon a lawn with a large weeping ash directly in front of the window and much too near for airiness or health a melancholy-looking tree in which theodore thought mrs danvers might have found a symbol of her own life as she stood at the window and looked at those dull drooping branches against a background of ivy-covered wall End of chapter three volume two chapter four of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four and if we do but watch the hour there never yet was human power which could evade if unforgiven the patient search and vigil long of him who treasures up a wrong theodore made a tour of the little garden in the summer sundown it was very small but its age gave it a superiority over most suburban gardens there were trees and hardy perennials that had been growing year after year blooming and fading with little care on the part of successive tenants the chief charm of the garden to some people might have been its seclusion there was no possibility of being overlooked in this narrow pleasance and overlooking is the curse of the average garden attached to the average villa mr and mrs jones taking their ease or working in their garden in the cool of the evening are uncomfortably conscious of mr and mrs smith eyeing them from the drawing-room windows of next door here the high wall on one side and the tall horse chestnuts on the other made a perfect solitude but seclusion on a very small scale is apt to merge into dullness and it must be owned that the garden of myrtle cottage at sundown was about as melancholy a place as the mind of man could imagine theodore contemplating it from the standpoint of mrs danvers history her friendlessness her sense of degradation wondered that she could have endured that dismal atmosphere for a single summer and she had lived there for many years lived there till weariness must have become loathing god help her poor soul he said to himself how she must have abhorred that weeping ash how it must have tortured her to see the leaves go and come again year after year and to know that neither spring nor autumn would better her fate he took down the address of the agent who had the letting of the house and left with the intention of seeing him that evening if possible the landlord was a personage resembling the mikado or the grand lama and was not supposed to be accessible to the human vision certainly not in relation to his house property the policeman's wife averred that him and the de crespignies owned half camberwell the agent was represented to live over his office which was in no less famous a locality than camberwell green and was likely therefore to oblige mr dalbrook by seeing him upon a business matter after business hours it was not much past seven when theodore entered the office where he found the agent extending his business hours so far as to be still seated at his desk deep in the revision of a catalogue 
he was a very genial agent and he put aside the catalogue immediately asked theodore to be seated and wheeled round his office chair to talk to him myrtle cottage yes a charming little box convenient and compact a bijou residence for a bachelor with a small establishment such a nice garden too retired and rustic if you were thinking of taking the property on a repairing lease the rent would be very moderate really a wonderfully advantageous occasion for any one wanting a pretty secluded place to tell you the truth mr adkins i am not thinking of taking that house or any house i have come to ask you a few questions about a former tenant and i shall take it as a favour if you will be so good as to answer them the agent looked disappointed but he put his pen behind his ear crossed his legs and prepared himself for conversation do you mean a recent tenant he asked no the gentleman i am interested in left myrtle cottage twenty years ago nearer five-and-twenty years perhaps his name was danvers the agent gave a suppressed whistle and looked at his interlocutor with increasing interest oh you wanted to know something about mr danvers was he an acquaintance of yours he was humph he is more than old enough to be your father he might almost be your grandfather do you know him intimately as intimately as a man of my age can know a man of his age and position added the agent looking at his visitor shrewdly theodore returned the look i don't quite follow your meaning he said come now sir if you know anything at all about the gentleman in question you must know that his name is not danvers and never was danvers that he took myrtle cottage under an assumed name and lived there for nearly ten years under that assumed name that he never let any of his friends or acquaintances cross his threshold and that he thought he had hoodwinked me me a man of the world moving about in the world among other men of the world why sir mr danvers had not paid me three half years rent in notes or gold as he always paid and in his office here before i had found out that he was the rising barrister mr dalbrook and before i had guessed the reason of his whole and corner style of life what became of the lady who was called mrs danvers and who in all probability was mrs danvers said mr atkins i have reason to believe that was her name what became of her god knows a servant came to me one august morning with the keys and a half year's rent the tenant had given notice to surrender at the michaelmas quarter that being the quarter at which he entered upon possession mr and mrs danvers had gone abroad to belgium the woman thought and as it was their present intention to live abroad their furniture had all been removed to the pantechnicon upon the previous day and the house was empty and at my disposal did you hear nothing more of them after that i heard of him sir as all the world heard of him heard of his marriage with a wealthy young spanish lady heard of his elevation to the peerage but of mrs danvers i never heard a syllable i take it she was pensioned off and that she lived and may have died on the continent why there are a lot of sleepy old flemish towns i'm a bit of a traveller in my quiet way which seem to have been created for that purpose is that all you can tell me about your tenants mr atkins i am not prompted by idle curiosity in my inquiries i have a very strong motive don't trouble yourself to explain sir i know nothing about mr or mrs danvers which i have any desire to hold back or which i am under any obligation to keep back my business relations with the gentleman never went beyond letting him myrtle cottage which i let to him without a reference on the strength of a twelve months rent in advance and a deuce of a hurry he was in to get into the place as for mrs danvers you may be surprised to hear that i never saw her face i am not a prying person and as the rent was never overdue i had no occasion to call at the house but i did see someone who had a strong bearing upon the lady's life and a very troublesome customer that person was who was he no less an individual than her husband a man dashed into this office one winter afternoon a little after dusk and asked me if i had let a house to a person called danvers i could see that he had been drinking and that he was in a state of strong excitement so i answered him shortly enough and i kept him well between myself and the door so as to be able to pitch him out if he got troublesome he told me that he'd just come from myrtle cottage that he had been refused admittance there although the woman who lived there was his wife he wanted to know if the house had been taken by her or by the scoundrel who passed himself off as her husband if it had been taken in her name it was his house and he would very soon let them know that he had the right to be there i told him that i knew nothing about him or his rights that my client's tenant was mr danvers and that there the business ended 
he was very violent upon this abused the tenant talked about his own wrongs and his wife's desertion of him asked me if i knew that this man who called himself danvers was an impostor who had taken the house in a false name and who was really a beggarly barrister called dalbrook and then from blasphemy and threatening he fell to crying and sat in my office shivering and whimpering like a half demented creature till i took compassion upon him so far as to give him a glass of brandy and send my office lad out with him to put him into a cab did he tell you his name or profession no he was uncommonly close about himself i asked him if the lady's name was really danvers and if he was mr danvers but he only stared at me in a vacant way with his drunken eyes it was hopeless trying to get a straight answer from him about anything heaven knows how he got home that night for he wouldn't tell the office boy his address and only told the cabman to drive to holborn i'll put him up when i get there he said he may have been driven about half the night for all i can tell was that all you ever saw or heard of him all i ever saw but not all i ever heard servants and neighbours will talk you see sir and i happen to be told of three or four occasions at considerable intervals at which my gentleman made unpleasantness at myrtle cottage he would go there wild with drink i believe he never went when he was sober and would kick up a row if he wanted to get his wife away from the life she was leading he would have gone to work in a different manner but it's my opinion he wanted nothing of the kind he was savage and vindictive in his cups and he wanted to frighten her and to annoy the man who had tempted her away from him but he was a poor creature and after blustering and threatening he would allow himself to be thrust out of doors like a stray cur what kind of a man did he look a broken-down gentleman yes i should say he had been a gentleman once but he had come down a longish way he had come down as low as drink and dissipation can bring a man altogether i should consider him a dangerous customer a man capable of violence of crime even perhaps a man who wouldn't have stopped at crime if he hadn't been a white-livered hound i tell you sir the fellow was afraid of mr dalbrook although mr dalbrook ought to have been afraid of him he was a craven to the core of his heart what age did you give him at the time he came to me i should put him down at about six and thirty and that is how many years ago say four and twenty i can't be certain to a year or so it wasn't a business transaction and i haven't any record of the fact was he a powerful-looking man he was the remains of a powerful man he must have been a fine man when he was ten years younger a handsome man too one of those fair-complexioned blue-eyed aquiline-nosed men who set off good clothes the kind of man to do justice to a rig out from a fashionable tailor he was a wreck when i saw him but he was the wreck of a handsome man and you take it that he was particularly vindictive he was as vindictive as a cur can be and was his anger strongest against the lady do you suppose or against the gentleman decidedly against the gentleman he was full of envy and hatred and all uncharitableness towards mr dalbrook he affected to think contemptuously of his talents and to belittle him in every way while he was bursting with envy at his growing success he was jealous and angry as a husband no doubt but he was still more jealous and still angrier as a disappointed man against a successful man he was as venomous as conscious failure can be and now sir that i have spoken so freely about this little domestic drama which was all past and done with twenty years ago and in which i only felt interested as a man of the world now may i ask your name and how you come to be so keenly interested in so remote an event my name is dalbrook replied theodore taking out his card and laying it upon the agent's desk you don't mean to say so a relation of lord cheriton's his cousin a distant cousin but warmly attached to him and his the motive of my inquiry need be no secret a dastardly murder was committed last summer in lord cheriton's house yes i remember the circumstances a seemingly motiveless murder unless it was the act of some secret foe foe either of the man who was killed or of his wife's father lord cheriton i have reason to know that the young man who was killed had never made an enemy his life was short and blameless now a malignant cur such as the man you describe a man possessed by the devil of drink would be just the kind of creature to assail the strong man through his defenceless daughter 
to murder her husband was to break her heart and to crush her father's hopes this man may have discovered long beforehand how my cousin had built upon that marriage how devoted he was to his daughter and how ambitious for her upon my soul i believe that you have given me the clue if we are to look for a blind unreasoning hatred malignity strong enough and irrational enough to strike the innocent in order to get at the guilty i do not think we can look for it in more likely a person than in the husband of mrs danvers perhaps not said mr atkins keenly interested yet dubious but granted that he is the man how are you to find him it is about four-and-twenty years since he stood where you are standing now and i have never set eyes on him from that day to this close upon a quarter of a century i can't tell you his calling or his kindred the place where he lived or even the name he bore with any certainty danvers may have been only an assumed name or it may have been his name there's no knowing or rather there's only one person likely to be able to help you in the matter and that is lord cheriton it would be difficult to question him upon such a subject of course it would and i don't suppose that even he has taken the trouble to keep himself posted in the movements of that very ugly customer having shunted the lady he wouldn't be likely to concern himself about the gentleman a quarter of a century said theodore too thoughtful to give a direct answer yes it must be very difficult to trace any man after such an interval but if that man went to cheriton chase he must have left some kind of trail behind him and it will go hard with me if i don't get upon that trail i thank you mr atkins for the most valuable information i have obtained yet and if any good comes of it you shall know good night good night sir i shall be very glad to aid in the cause of justice yes i remember the cheriton chase murder and i should like to see the mystery cleared up End of chapter four volume two chapter five of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five upon a tone a touch of hers his blood would ebb and flow and his cheek changed tempestuously but she in these fond feelings had no share her sighs were not for him to her he was even as a brother but no more after that conversation with the house agent the idea that he had found the clue to the cheriton chase mystery took root in theodore dalbrook's mind taking as his starting point the notion of a deadly hatred wreaking itself in an indirect revenge there seemed no more likely figure for the role of avenger than that of the wronged and deserted husband the one startling improbability in this view of the case was the long interval between the husband's appearance at myrtle cottage and the date of the murder but even this difficulty theodore was able to account for upon the hypothesis of a gradual perversion a descent from vice to crime as the man's nature hardened under the corrupting influence of a profligate life while the old festering sore grew into a malignant canker under the lash of misery he had seen in that great seething cauldron of london life men whose countenances bore the stamp of a degradation so profound that the most ferocious crime might seem the normal outcome of their perverted natures he could imagine how the broken-down gentleman steeped in drink and embittered by the idea of wrongs which had been the natural consequence of his own misconduct had sunk step by step upon the ladder of vice till he had arrived at that lowest deep where the dreams of men are stained with blood and darkened by the shadow of a hangman he could imagine such a man brooding over his wrongs for long years nursing his jealous wrath as the one touch of manliness that survived in him until some newspaper description of the dalbrook and carmichael wedding reminded him of the bitter contrast between his own lot and that of his rival and lashed into sudden fury he set out upon his murderous errand hardly caring whom he murdered so long as he could hurt the man he hated the very fact that mr danvers husband had been described as a craven made the idea of his guilt more likely only a coward would have chosen such a revenge only a coward could have stretched out his hand from the darkness to kill a man who had never injured him the crime was the crime of a coward or a madman and this man brutalized by drink may have been both madman and coward here at least was a man closely associated with james dalbrook's life and having good cause to hate him in the darkness surrounding the murder of godfrey carmichael this was the first flash of light 
and having arrived at this point theodore dalbrook saw himself face to face with the new and seemingly insurmountable difficulty to follow this clue to the end to bring the crime home to the husband of lord cheriton's cast-off mistress was to expose the history of the great man's earlier years to the world at large to offer up a reputation which had hitherto been stainless as a rich and savoury repast to that carrion brood consisting of almost everybody which loves to feast upon garbage how the evening newspapers would revel in the details of such a story what denunciations what gloating over the weakness of a strong man's life how the contents bills would bristle with appetizing headings how the shrill-voiced newsboys would yell their startling particulars their latest developments of the cheriton chase scandal this must all inevitably follow upon the discovery of the murder if the murderer were indeed the injured husband there could be no possible escape from that glare of publicity that swelling symphony of slander from the moment the law laid its hand upon the criminal the case would pass beyond individual control and individual interests and reputations would become as naught justice would have to do its work and in the doing of it must needs afford the usual opportunity to the newspapers theodore thought with horror of such humiliation coming upon lord cheriton and threw him upon juanita who loved her father with a reverential affection and who was intensely proud of his character and position he thought of gentle lady cheriton who adored her husband and who doubtless would be made miserable by the knowledge that his first love had been given to another woman whom he had loved well enough to sacrifice honour for the sake of that illicit love what agony to that single-minded trusting creature to find that dark spot upon her husband's past and to know that the daughter's happiness had been blighted because of the father's sin with these considerations in his mind it seemed to theodore that it would be better to halt on the very threshold of discovery and yet there was the appalling thought of further possibilities in the way of crime of a madman's revenge carried a stage further a madman's pistol aimed at the defenceless mother or the unconscious child what was he to do was there no alternative between inaction and such action as must speedily set in motion the machinery of the law and thus deprive him of all free will in the future conduct of the case yes there was an alternative course if he were once assured of the identity of the assassin it might be in his power to lay hands upon him and to place him under such circumstances of control in the future as would ensure one eat his safety and render any further crime impossible if the man were mad as theodore thought more than likely he might be quietly got into an asylum if he were still master of his actions he might be got abroad to the remotest colony in the antipodes the knowledge of his crime would be a hold over him a lever which would remove him to the uttermost ends of the earth if need were this would be an illegal compromise no doubt unjustifiable in the eye of the law but if it ensured juanita's safety and saved her father's character the compromise was worth making it was indeed the only way by which her security and her father's good name could be provided for to arrive at this result he had to find the man who had appeared in mr atkins's office about four-and-twenty years ago and of whose subsequent existence he theodore had no knowledge i must begin at the other end he told himself if that man was the murderer he must have been seen in the neighbourhood it is not possible that he could have come to the place and watched for his opportunity and got clear off after the deed was done without being seen by human eyes and yet there remained the fact that the local policeman and a london detective had both failed in obtaining the faintest trace of a suspicious-looking stranger or indeed of any stranger male or female who had been observed in the neighbourhood of cheriton before or after the murder there remained the fact that a large reward had been offered without resulting in one scrap of information bearing upon the subject how could he hope in the face of these facts to trace the movements of a man whose personal appearance was unknown to him and who had come and gone like a shadow i can but try and i can but fail he told himself knowing what i know now i cannot remain inactive it may be that he had caught something of the fiery eagerness which consumed juanita that in his ardent desire to be worthy of her regard to waste his life in her service he had become as it were inoculated with the spirit of his mistress and hoped as she hoped and thought as she thought with the beginning of the long vacation he went to dorchester but this time not alone he took his friend cuthbert ramsay with him as a visitor to the grave old house in the grave old town 
his sisters often made a complaint against him that he never introduced any of his college friends to them that whereas the sisters of other university men were rich in the acquaintance of charlie's and algernon's and fred's and tom's who were producible at tennis parties and available for picnics at the shortest notice they were restricted to the use of dorchester in a horizon bounded by the country houses of the immediate neighbourhood remembering these reproaches and seeing that his friend ramsay was obviously pining for rest and country air theodore suggested that he should occupy the bachelor's room in cornhill as long as he could venture to stop away from hospitals and lectures and scientific investigations you want a long fallow cuthbert he said and you couldn't have a better lotus island than dorchester there's not an excitement or a fever sensation to be had within twenty miles and then i really want to make you known to my cousin lord cheriton he is a very clever man an all-around man and he would be interested in you and all that you are doing i shall be proud of knowing him and then there is your cousin lady carmichael i am deeply interested in her without having ever seen her face and when i do see her you will say she is one of the loveliest women you ever saw in your life cuthbert i have no doubt of that you will see her beauty under a cloud for she is not one of those women who begin to get over the loss of a husband as soon as their crape gets rusty but her beauty is all the more touching on account of the grief that separates her from all other women even from her past self i sometimes look at her and wonder if this sad and silent woman can be the juanita i once knew the light-hearted spontaneous girl a buoyant creature all impulse and caprice fancy and imagination you may be sure that i shall admire her and you may be sure i shall not forget that there is some one whose admiration has a deeper root than the lust of the eye and the fancy of the moment theodore would not affect to misunderstand him it was not possible that he could have talked of his cousin in the freedom of friendship without having revealed his secret to his friend my dear fellow he said with a sigh mine is a hopeless case you will know that it is so when you see juanita and me together her mother said to me on the first day of this year if ever she comes to care for anybody it will be some new person and i have not the least doubt that her mother was right her first love was her playfellow the companion of her girlhood a woman cannot have two such loves her second attachment if she ever make one will be of a totally different character who knows theodore a woman's heart is to be measured by no calipers that i know of it is subject to no scientific test we cannot say it shall give this or that result it may remain cold as marble to a man through years of faithful devotion and then in an instant the marble may change to a volcano and hidden fires may leap out of that seeming coldness nil desperandum should be the motto of all inventors and of all lovers dorchester and especially the old house in cornhill received mr ramsay with open arms harrington was in the dejected state of a young man who has been rudely awakened from youth's sweetest delusion fooled and forsaken by juliet baldwin he had told himself that all women are liars and was doing all in his power to establish his reputation as a woman-hater in this temper of mind he was not averse from his own sex and he welcomed his brother's friend with unaffected cordiality and was evidently cheered by the new life which ramsay's vivacity brought into the quiet atmosphere of home the sisters were delighted to do honour to a scientific man and were surprised on attacking mr ramsay at dinner with the ease and aplomb of confrères in modern science to discover one of two things either that he knew nothing or that they knew very little they were at first inclined to the former opinion but it gradually dawned upon them that their own much valued learning was of a very elementary character and that their facts were for the most part wrong chastened by this discovery they allowed the conversation to drift into lighter channels and never again tackled mr ramsay either upon the broad and open subject of evolution or the burning question of the cholera bacillus they were even content to leave him to the enjoyment of his own views upon spontaneous generation and the movement of glaciers instead of setting him right upon both subjects as they had intended in the beginning of their acquaintance he is remarkably handsome but horribly dogmatic sophia told her brother and i'm afraid he belongs to the showy shallow school which has arisen since the death of darwin he would hardly have dared to talk as he did at dinner during darwin's lifetime perhaps not if darwin had been omnipresent oh there is a restraining influence in the very existence of such a man he is a perpetual court of appeal against arrogant smatterers 
i don't think you can call a man who took a first class in science a smatterer sophie however i'm sorry you don't like my friend i like him well enough but i'm not imposed upon by his dogmatism the two young men drove to millbrook priory on the following day theodore feeling painfully eager to discover what change the last few months had made in juanita she had been in switzerland with lady jane and the baby living first at grindelwald and later in one of those little villages on the shores of the lake of the forest cantons which combine the picturesque and the dull in a remarkable degree a mere cluster of chalets and cottages at the foot of the rigi facing the monotonous beauty of the lake and the calm grandeur of snow-capped mountains which shut in that tranquil corner of the earth and shut out all the busy world beyond it nowhere else had juanita felt that deep sense of seclusion that feeling of being remote from the din and press of life and now she was again at the priory she had settled down there in her new position as widow and mother a woman for whom all life's passionate story was over who must live henceforward for that new life growing day by day towards that distant age of passion and of sorrow through which she had passed suddenly and briefly crowding into a month the emotions of a lifetime there are women who have lived to celebrate their golden wedding who in fifty years of wedlock have not felt half her sum of love and who in losing the companion of half a century have not felt half her sum of grief it is the capacity for loving and suffering which differs in different people and weighed against that time counts but little she received her cousin with all her old friendliness she was a little more cheerful than when last they met and he saw that the new interest of her life had done good lady jane was at swanage and juanita was alone at the priory though not without the expectation of company a little later in the year as the sisters and their husbands were to be with her before the first of october so that the expense of pheasant breeding might not be altogether wasted you must be here as much as you can in october theodore she said and help me to endure mr grenville and mr morningside one talks nothing but sport and the other insists upon teaching me the science of politics she received cuthbert ramsay with a serious sweetness which charmed him yes she was verily beautiful among women exceptionally beautiful those southern eyes shone star-like in the settled pallor of her face and her whole countenance was etherealized by thought and grief it touched the stranger to see how she struggled to put away the memory of her sorrow and to receive him with all due hospitality how she restrained herself as she showed him the things that had been a part of her dead husband's existence and told him the story of the old house which had sheltered so many generations of carmichaels lady cheriton had been lunching at the priory where she came at least twice a week to watch her grandson's development in all those graces of mind and person which marked his superiority to the average baby she came all the oftener because of the difficulty in getting juanita to cheriton my poor child will hardly ever visit us she told theodore as they sauntered on the lawn while juanita was showing mr ramsay the pictures in the dining-room she has an insurmountable horror of the house she was once so fond of and i can't wonder at it and i can't be angry with her i have seen how painfully her old home affects her so i don't worry her to come to us often i make a point of getting her there once in a way in the hope of overcoming her horror of the place as time goes by and i have even gone out of my way to make changes in the furniture and decorations so that the rooms should not look exactly the same as they looked in her fatal honeymoon but i can see in her face that every corner of the house is haunted for her once when she had been calm and cheerful with me for a whole afternoon walking about the garden and going from room to room she flung herself into my arms suddenly sobbing passionately we were so happy mother she said so happy in this fatal house we must bear with her poor girl god has given her a dark lot theodore had seen an anxious questioning look in juanita's eyes from the beginning of his visit and he took the first opportunity of being alone with her while lady cheriton entertained mr ramsay with an exposition of the merits of her grandson who was calmly slumbering in a hammock on the lawn unconscious of her praises and half smothered in embroidered coverlets have you found out anything she asked eagerly as soon as they were out of earshot yes i believe i have really come upon a clue and that i may ultimately discover the murderer but i can give you no details as yet the whole thing is too vague how clever of you to succeed where the police have utterly failed oh theodore you cannot imagine how i shall value you how deeply grateful stop juanita for heaven's sake don't praise me i may be chasing a will-o'-the-wisp 
i don't suppose that any experienced detective would take up such a clue as i am going to follow only you have set me to do this thing and it has become the business of my life to obey you you are all that is good pray tell me everything you have discovered however vague your ideas may be no juanita i can tell you nothing yet you must trust me dear i am at best only on the threshold of a discovery it may be long before i advance another step be content to know that i am not idle she gave an impatient sigh it is so hard to be kept in the dark she said i dream night after night that i myself am on the track of his murderer sometimes that i meet him face to face oh the hideous pallid face the face of a man who has been hanged and brought to life again it is always the same kind of face the same dull livid hue though it differs as to features though the man is never the same you cannot imagine the agony of those dreams theodore lay that ghost for me if you can make my life peaceful though it can never be happy never is a long word nita as the years go by your child's love will give life a new colour yes he is very dear he has crept into my heart a little nestling unconscious thing knowing nothing of my love or my sorrow and yet seeming to comfort me i sometimes think my darling spirit looks out of those clear eyes they seem so full of thought of thought far beyond human wisdom theodore could see that the work of healing was being done slowly but surely the gracious influence of a new love was being exercised and the frozen heart was reviving to life and warmth under the soft touch of those baby fingers he saw his cousin smile with something of the old brightness as she stood by while cuthbert ramsay dandled the little lord of carmichael priory in his great strong arms smiling down at the tiny pink face peeping out a cloud of lace and muslin any one can see that mr ramsay is fond of children said lady charrington approvingly as if a liking for infants just short-coated were the noblest virtue of manhood oh i am fond enough of the little beggars answered cuthbert lightly all the gutter brats about st thomas's know me and hang on to my coat-tails as i go by i like to look at a child's face those old shrewd london faces especially and speculate upon the life that lies before those younglings the things those eyes are to see the words those lips are to speak life is such a tremendous mystery don't you know one can never be tired of wondering about it but this fellow is going to be very happy and a great man in the land he is going to belong to the new order the order of the rich who go through life shoulder to shoulder with the poor the redressers of wrongs the adjusters of social levels i hope you are not a socialist mr ramsay said lady cheriton with an alarmed air not much but i acknowledge that there are points where my ideas touch the boundary line of socialism i don't want impossibilities i have no dream of a day where there shall be no more millionaires no great patrons of art or great employers of labour but only a dead level of small means and shabby dwellings and sordid colourless lives no there must be butterflies as well as ants if it were only that the ants may have something pretty to look at what i should like to see is a stronger bond of friendship and sympathy between the two classes a real knowledge and understanding of each other between rich and poor and the twin demons patronage and sycophancy exercised for ever and ever the tea-tables were brought out upon the lawn by this time sir godfrey carmichael was carried off by his nurse and the two young men sat down with lady cheriton and her daughter under the tree beneath which juanita and her husband had sat on that one blissful day which they had spent together at the priory as man and wife they seemed a very cheery and pleasant quartet as they sat in the sultry afternoon atmosphere with the level lawn and flower-bed stretching before them and the white belt of old timber shutting out all the world beyond cuthbert ramsay was the chief talker full of animal spirits launching the wildest paradoxes the most unorthodox opinions the very sound of his strong full voice the very ring of his buoyant laugh were enough to banish gloomy thoughts and sad memories lady cheriton was delighted with this new acquaintance first because he was dexterous in handling a baby next on the score of general merits she was not a deeply read person but she had a profound respect for culture in other people and she had an idea that a scientific man was a creature apart belonging to a loftier world than that which she and her intellectual equals inhabited theodore had told her of his friend's claims to distinction 
his hard work in several cities and seeing this earnest worker boyish and light-hearted interested in the most frivolous subjects she was lost in wonder at his condescension she begged him to go to cheriton with theodore at the earliest opportunity an invitation which he accepted gladly i have long wished to know lord cheriton he said the two young men left soon after tea cuthbert's high spirits deserted him at the priory gates and both men were thoughtful during the homeward drive well cuthbert what do you think of my cousin now that you have seen her theodore asked when he had driven the first mile i can only agree with you my dear fellow she is a very lovely woman i think there could hardly be two opinions upon that point and do you think as i do that it is hopeless for any man to spend his life in worshipping her do you think her heart is buried with her dead husband only as proserpine was buried with pluto it is not in human nature for so young a woman to wear her weeds for a lifetime the hour of revival must come sooner or later she has too bright and quick an intellect to submit to the monotony of an inconsolable sorrow her energy expends itself now in the desire to avenge her husband's death failing in that her restless spirit will seek some new outlet she is beginning to be interested in her child as that interest grows with the child's growth her horizon will widen and then and then when she has discovered that life can still be beautiful her heart will become accessible to a new love the cure and the change the awakening from death to life may be slower than it is in most such cases because this woman is the essence of sincerity and all her feelings lie deep but the awakening will come you may be sure of that wait for it theodore possess your soul in patience you can afford to be philosophical said the other with a sigh you are not in love true my friend no doubt that makes a difference End of chapter five volume two chapter six of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six and one an english home grey twilight poured on dewy pastures dewy trees softer than sleep all things in order stored a haunt of ancient peace theodore and his friend betook themselves to cheriton chase on the following friday for that kind of visit which north country people describe as a week-end they carried their portmanteau in that portion of the dog-cart which is more legitimately occupied by a leash of spaniels or irish setters and they arrived in the golden light of the afternoon just when that sunk lane approaching the west gate was looking its loveliest hart's tongue and rocky boulder the great brown trunks of the oaks and the polypodium growing amidst their cloven branches were all touched with sun-gleams while evening shadows lay soft and cool upon the tall flowering grasses in the meadows on either side of the deep gully that is mrs porter's cottage said theodore indicating the gatekeeper's house with a turn of his whip towards the end of the lane where the clustered chimneys showed through a gap in the trees ramsay had been introduced to miss newton and had constituted himself honorary surgeon and medical adviser to that lady and all her humble friends he had been invited to the tea-parties in wedgwood street and had interested himself in the young woman called marian and in her probable identity with the lodge-keeper's missing daughter for which reason he had a keen desire to make the lodge-keeper's acquaintance from your account of the lady she must be a piece of human adamant he said i like to tackle that kind of individual i've met a few of them and i'm happy to say that if i haven't been able to melt them i've generally succeeded in making them smart i should enjoy exhibiting my moral aquafortis in the case of this lady i shall get you to accompany me in a morning call upon her while we are at cheriton my dear cuthbert i would sooner call uninvited and without credentials upon the archbishop of canterbury i don't forget how she froze me when i tried to be friendly with her last new year's day she was more biting than the northeast wind that was curdling the ponds in the park a fig for her bitingness do you suppose i mind if you won't take me to her i shall go by myself a character of that kind has an irresistible fascination for me i would go a hundred miles any day to see a bitter bad woman she is bitter enough but she may not be bad she may be only a creature who mistakes fanaticism for religion who has so misread her bible that she thinks it her bounden duty to shut her heart against a beloved child rather than to forgive a sinner i believe she is to be pitied rather than blamed odious as she may seem very likely a hard heart or an obstinate temper is a disease like other diseases 
one ought to be sorry for the sufferer but this woman has a strong character anyhow for good or evil and i delight in studying character the average man and woman is so colourless that there is infinite relief in the study of any temperament which touches the extreme think how delightful it would be to meet such a man as iago or othello picture to yourself the pleasure of watching the gradual unfolding of such a mind as iachimo's and consider how keen would be one's interest in getting to the bottom of a woman like that poisoning stepmother of imogen's whose name shakespeare does not take the trouble to record so this is the lodge charming early english cottage real rustic english not bedford parkish half timbered thatched gables dormers like eyes under bushy eyebrows walls four feet thick lattice is two hundred years old it might be the very cottage in which grandmamma wolf waited for the dear plump little girl with chubby cheeks shining like the butter in her basket and with lips as sweet as her honey poor little girl the servant-maid ran down the steps to open the gate and as the wheel stopped an upper casement swung suddenly open and a woman's face appeared in the golden light a pale wan face whose most noticeable expression was a look of infinite weariness anemic said cuthbert as they drove in at the gate decidedly anemic i should suspect that woman of what of being a vegetarian answered cuthbert gravely but i'll call to-morrow and find out all about her lord cheriton received his kinsman's friend with marked cordiality and seemed to enjoy his freshness and spontaneity they talked of cambridge the cambridge of forty years ago and the cambridge of to-day and they talked of the continental schools of medicine a subject in which the lawyer was warmly interested there were no other visitors expected before september when three old friends of lord cheriton's were to shoot the partridges in october there was to be a large party for the pheasant shooting which was the chief glory of cheriton chase there had been no shooters at the chase last year and lord cheriton felt himself so much the more constrained to hospitality you fellows must come in october when we have our big shoot he said but cuthbert ramsay told him that he must be at work again in london before the end of september cuthbert was much impressed by the master of cheriton chase and the grave and quiet dignity with which he wore success that might have made a weaker man arrogant and self-assertive it would seem as if scarcely anything were wanting to that prosperous career yet cuthbert saw that his host was not free from a cloud of care it was natural perhaps that he should feel the tragedy of his son-in-law's death as a lasting trouble not to be shuffed off and forgotten when the conventional period of mourning was past theodore had some private talk with his cousin on the first evening of his visit walking up and down the terrace while cuthbert was looking at the books in the library under lady cheriton's guidance he had it fully in his mind that the time must come when he would be obliged to take lord cheriton into his confidence but he felt that time was still far off whenever the revelation came it must needs be infinitely painful to both and deeply humiliating to the man whose hidden sin had brought desolation upon his innocent daughter and untimely death upon the man whose fate had been linked with hers it was for his dishonour for the wrongs inflicted by him that those two had made expiation no the time to be outspoken the time to say in the words of the prophet thou art the man had not yet come when it should come he would be prepared to act resolutely and fearlessly but in the meantime he must needs go on working in the dark he remembered his last conversation with lord cheriton on that subject remembered how cheriton had said that he believed godfrey carmichael incapable of a dishonourable action incapable of having behaved cruelly to any woman had he who pronounced that judgment been guilty of dishonour had he been cruel to the woman who sacrificed herself for him there are so many degrees in such wrong-doing there is the sin of impulse there is the deliberate betrayal the coldly planned iniquity the sin of the practised seducer who has reduced seduction to a science and who has no more heart or conscience than a machine there is the sin of the generous man who finds his feet caught in the web of circumstance who begins innocently enough by pitying a neglected wife and ends by betraying the neglectful husband theodore gave his kinsman credit for belonging to the category of generous sinners indeed the fact that he had lived aloof from the world for many years sharing the isolation of the woman who loved him was in itself evidence that he had not acted as a villain yet it was possible that when the final hour came the hour for breaking those illicit bonds the rupture may have been in some wise cruel and the remembrance of that cruelty might be a burden upon the sinner's conscience at this day such partings can never be without cruelty 
the fact that one sinner is to marry and begin a new life while the other sinner is to finish her days in a dishonoured widowhood is in itself a cruelty she may submit as to a fate which she foresaw dimly even in the hour of her fall but she would be more than human if she did not think herself hardly used by the man who forsakes her nothing he can do to secure her worldly comfort or to screen her from the world's disdain will take the sting out of that parting the one fact remains that her day is done he has ceased to care for her and he has begun to care for another nothing has occurred since i was here to throw any light upon the murder i suppose theodore said quietly as they smoked their cigars walking slowly up and down the summer night nothing did her ladyship tell you that i have met a girl in london whom i believe to be no other than mercy porter yes she told me something about that fancy of yours for i take it to be nothing more than a fancy the world is too wide for you and mercy porter to meet so easily what was your ground for identifying her with the lodge-keeper's girl the lodge-keeper's girl there was something needlessly contemptuous in the phrase it seemed to theodore a studied disdain it was she herself who suggested the idea by her inquiries about cheriton she confessed to having come from this part of the world and she has an air of refinement which shows that she does not belong to the peasant class she is a very good pianist plays with remarkable taste and feeling and lady cheriton tells me that mercy had a talent for music i have no doubt in my own mind that this young woman is mercy porter and i think her mother ought to go to london and see her even if she should not think fit to bring her back to the home she left mrs porter is a woman of peculiar temper the girl may be happier away from her yes that is very likely but the mother ought to forgive her the penitent sinner whose life for the last few years has been blameless ought to feel that she is pardoned and at peace with her mother i tried to approach the subject but mrs porter repelled me with an almost vindictive air and i do not think it would be any good for me to plead for my poor friend again if you or lady cheriton would talk to her i will get my wife to manage her it is a matter in which a woman would have more influence than you or i in the meantime if there is anything i can do to make mercy porter's life easier i shall be very glad to do it for her father's sake you are very good but she is not in want and she seems content with her lot what is she doing for a living her employment is fine needlework she lives in one small back room in lambeth and has only one friend in the world and that friend happens to be a lady who once lived in this house a lady who lived in this house exclaimed lord cheriton who in heaven's name do you mean miss newton who was governess to miss strangway nearly forty years ago what brought miss newton and you together that is rather a long story i took some trouble to find the lady in order to settle one question which had disturbed my cousin juanita since her husband's death what question she was haunted by an idea that sir godfrey's murderer was one of the strangways and his murder an act of vengeance by some member of that banished race it was in order to set this question at rest for ever that i took some trouble to hunt out the history of squire strangway's two sons and only daughter i traced them all three to their graves and have been able to convince juanita that they and their troubles were at rest long before the time of her husband's murder what could have put such a notion into her head oh it came naturally enough it was only a development of churton's idea of a vendetta she was always full of fancies yes i remember she used to say the house was haunted by the ghosts of the strangways i really think she had a dim idea that i had injured that spendthrift race in buying the estate which they had wasted and so to satisfy juanita you took the trouble to ferret out miss newton upon my word theodore your conduct is more quixotic than i could have believed of any young man in the nineteenth century and pray by what means did you discover the ci-devant governess theodore told the story of his visit to the scholastic agencies his journey to westmoreland and his friendly reception by miss newton in her lambeth lodgings she was much attached to miss strangway who was her first charge and near enough to her own age to be more of a companion than a pupil he said and she spoke of her melancholy fate with great tenderness it was a melancholy fate was it i know she made a runaway marriage but in what way was her fate sadder than the common destiny of a spendthrift's daughter a girl who has been reared in extravagance and self-indulgence and who finds herself face to face with penury in the bloom of her womanhood that in itself would be sad but miss strangway's destiny was sadder than that commonplace enough no doubt 
only the old story of an unhappy marriage and a runaway wife he could not help looking at lord cheriton at this point thinking how this common story of an unfaithful wife must needs remind his kinsman of that other story of another wife which had influenced his early manhood he must surely have a sensitive shrinking from the discussion of any similar story she ran away from her husband yes i remember having heard as much what did miss newton know about her beyond that one fact very little only that she died at boulogne nearly twenty years ago this fact miss newton heard from the lips of the man for whom mrs darcy left her husband i had been at boulogne a week or so before i saw miss newton and i had hunted there for any record of mrs darcy's death without result but this is not very strange as it is quite likely that she lived at boulogne under an assumed name and was buried in that name and so lies there in a foreign land dissevered for ever from any association with her name and kindred there are not many of her kindred left i take it said lord cheriton there seems to have been a blight upon that race for the last half a century but now tell me about some one in whom i am more interested the girl you believe to be mercy porter i should be very glad to make her life happier and so i told her ladyship you theodore might be the intermediary i would allow her a hundred a year which would enable her to live in some pretty country place in devonshire or cornwall for instance in some quiet sea-coast village where no one would know anything about her or her story a hundred a year my dear cheriton that is a most generous offer no no there is no question of generosity her father was my friend and i was under some obligation to him and then the girl was my wife's protege and finally i can very well afford it i am almost a childless man theodore my grandson will be rich enough when i am gone rich enough to be sure of a peerage i hope so that there may be a baron cheriton when i am in the dust you are very good i believe this girl has a great deal of pride the pride of a woman who has drunk the cup of shame and she may set herself against being your pensioner but if the matter can be arranged as you wish she may yet see happier days i think the first thing to be done is to reconcile mother and daughter mrs porter ought to go up to london to see miss newton's protege on no account i tell you mrs porter is a woman of strange temper god knows how bitterly she might upbraid her daughter and if the girl is proud as you say she is the mother's reproaches would goad her to refuse any help from me or my wife no theodore the longer we keep mother and daughter apart the better for mercy's chances of happiness but if this young woman should refuse to confess her identity with mercy porter it will be impossible to benefit her that difficulty may be easily overcome you can take my wife to see her she was always fond of my wife and you will leave the mother out of the question that seems rather hard upon her i tell you theodore it is better to leave the mother out of the question she never acted a mother's part to mercy there was never any real motherly love at least that was lady cheriton's opinion of the woman and she had ample opportunity for judging which of course i had not if you want to help the daughter keep the mother aloof from her i dare say you are right and i shall of course obey you implicitly said theodore inwardly reluctant he had an exalted idea of maternal love its obligations and privileges and it seemed to him a hard thing to come between a penitent daughter and a mother whose heart ought to be full of pity and pardon yet he remembered his brief interview with mrs porter and he could but own to himself that this might be an exceptional case End of chapter 6